Okay, for our first video, we're going to learn about functions and their properties. Um, basically, you're going to be able to look at a relationship and determine if it's a special type of relation called a function. You're going to be able to do this um, with a set of points, with a table of values, with an equation, and with the graph. And then we're going to look at identifying the domain of a function and some shortcuts of finding that when you're given just the equation. Finding the zeros of a function, what are the zeros and how to find them, and special types of function called even and odd functions. So I want to start with some definitions. So a relation is a set of order pairs, so any grouping of points. But a function, on the other hand, is a special type of relationship um, for which each input or domain value is associated with exactly one output value, which is called a range value. Okay, determine whether a relation is a function or not. First thing you got to do is you must decide if each domain value is matched with exactly one range value. Okay, so each domain goes to one range value. When a when any domain value of a relation is matched with two or more range values, the relation is not a function. A function is an equation for which any x that can be plugged into the equation will yield exactly one y as the output of the function. Now this one is very helpful, Star, um, three stars here, is very helpful when you're looking at the equation. So basically, you would solve the equation for y. If you get y equals to a single equation, you know you have a function. But if your y is equal to multiple equations or where you can get different answers out, so one, you know, plugging in x would yield more than one y value, it is not a function. So here is an example of how to do this. First, we're going to look at a list of points. This I put as a table for part A. So the first thing I notice, I have x values of 2, 3, 4, and 5. But on x value of 5, x is sometimes going to 0, and x, uh, x of 5 is sometimes going to 1. So since 5 is going to more than one y value, this is not a function. Okay. B is just plotting these points here. These are discrete points. So we have the point 1, 1, the point 2, 1, the point 3, 5, the point 4, 3, and the point 5, 1. So if I'm looking at these points, I only have one x value going to, each x value is going to only one y value. 1 is going to 1, the x of 2 is going to always to 1, the x of 3 is going to 5, the x of 4 is always going to 3, and the x of 5 is always going to 1. So this is a function. Okay, and equation C and C here, it's an equation. So I'm going to solve this equation for y. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract x squared from each side so I can get the y by itself. And then the opposite of squaring something is to take the square root. Now remember, anytime you take the square root, you have to do plus or minus. So regardless of what x value I get, when I plug in some x value here, I'm going to end up with positive or negative that number. And so that's giving me two answers for every x. So this is not a function. Do the same thing for the second equation. I'm going to subtract the 2x from each side to get the attempt to get the y by itself. Now I am multiplying y by 3, so that means I need to divide each side by 3. So y is equal to 4 minus 2x divided by 3. Now, regardless of what x I put, you know, say I put 1 in here in place of the x, I get 4 minus 2, which is 2. 2 divided by 3 is 2 thirds. And so I get a single answer. So regardless of what x, I'm going to get a single answer. So this is an example of a function. I got y explicitly defined as a single equation, whereas up here, y, y is implicitly defined because it's defined as two functions. Okay, graphically, you can figure out if a function is a, if a 
relation is a function or not by doing something called the vertical line test. Okay, so the vertical line test for functions state that a graph is a function if and only if no vertical line, line in, intersects the graph at more than one point. Okay, so it doesn't matter where you draw the vertical line, but any vertical line. So you, so like I could draw a vertical line here and only intersects the graph at one point, but if I draw a vertical line here, it would intersect the graph more than once. So if any vertical line drawn on your graph intersects the graph more than once, it is not a function. So this one would be not a function by the vertical line test. And so here, any vertical line I draw intersects at most one. Now this one never intersected, but that's okay. Because at most, it, at no more than one point, so it could not intersect it, but no more than one. So this is an example of a function. Okay, now that we know basically what a function is and a relation is, we're going to now learn something called function notation. This is the way that the reader, um, this way that the author can tell the reader, the person working the problem, that they know that this equation they're working with is a function. And function notation is just replacing the y with um, a symbol, um, f of x, g of x, h of x, something like that. So the symbol f of x is a function notation that's read the value of f at x, or simply, as I read it earlier, f of x. Now remember... The f part of that notation is the name of the function, whereas f of x is the value or the y value of the function at x. Okay, so what does this mean in turn example? So basically, if you see a problem like this, whoops, see a problem like here, f of, z, f of 2. So this is like instructions. It's telling you, to evaluate the function at two. So what you do is you go into the original equation, which is our f of x equation, which is defined up here. And everywhere I see an x, I'm gonna plug in what this x has been replaced with. So I'm gonna plug in a two in place of every x in my original f function. Okay, then you're going to simplify. Order of operation, you do exponents first, so 2 squared is 4, and 2 squared down here is still 4. Okay, and then multiplication comes next. So that gives us 8 plus 3, and then addition and subtraction. 8 plus 3 is 11, 4 minus 1 is 3, and so 11 thirds is my answer. Now, in higher level mathematics, as we're doing in this college, um, college algebra level class, um, we always write our improper fraction, always write our large fractions larger than one as improper fractions, and we always simplify them if we can. So I would write this as 11 thirds. You do not want to write this as nine, uh, three and two thirds. Okay, I never want to see that. So we don't we don't use max numbers in most cases. So we keep it improper unless stated otherwise. Okay, so for our next example, here you're asked to find f of x minus 1. So again, in place of the x in this original equation, I'm going to plug in x minus 1. So I go back to the original equation, 2, and we had x squared plus 3 over x squared minus 1. Now in place of that x, I'm going to plug in x minus 1. So I'm just replacing every x in that original equation with x minus 1. And then I'm going to solve this. I need to do my squares first. So x minus 1 squared means I got x minus 1 times x minus 1. And so remember, that's not x squared minus, minus 1. You don't just distribute the square because it's this times itself. And in order to solve, solve this type of problem, we have to use our full method. So first terms multiplied together gives us x squared. 
So that was the first terms. Now our outer terms gives us negative x. Our inner terms is negative x. And our last terms are positive 1. And then likewise in the bottom, we get the same thing. We'll go ahead and combine negative x minus x is negative 2x. Okay. And then let me do that in the top as well. And plus 1 minus 1 just disappears, so that cancels out. Okay, now I got to do multiplication, so I'm going to distribute that 2 to everything inside the parentheses. Okay, and then combine like terms. And then we see if we can simplify it down. Factors of 10 that add to equal negative 4. There isn't any, so that does not factor. And so that would be my answer to f of x minus 1. So sometimes it can get a little challenging, but you do the same process. Just remember, everywhere you see whatever is inside the f of f of x fun notation, that is replaced in place of every x in the original problem. And then you just simplify down. Okay, so let's do one if I'm giving you more than one function. Now remember, f of x is not the only notation we use for function. Now I have this second function that I'm gonna call g of x. So I got function f and function g. And I wanna figure out f of negative one divided by two times g of Five. So I need to figure out what f of negative 1 is. So this tells me I go to my f function, and everywhere I see an x in that f function, I plug in negative 1. So my f function is negative 3 times x plus 2, and then place that x with a negative 1. So that gives us 3 plus 2, which is 5. And that gives us our numerator, for this fraction because it says okay f of negative 1 well we figured out f of mapping 1 equals 5 so I can put 5 here and then I got 2 times g of 5 so now I need to figure out what g of 5 is equal to so now I go to my g function and everywhere I see a x I plug in 5 so 1 half times x minus 1 we place that x with 5 that gives us 5 halves minus 1. I'm going to choose to write that 1 as 2 over 2, so I can have a common denominator here. And that gives us 3 halves. So g of 5 is equal to 3 halves. So I take f of negative, negative 1, divide it by 2 times g of 5. So now I can work through this problem. I got 5 multiplying 2 times 3 halves just gives us 3, so the answer to this function, um, f of negative 1 divided by 2 times g of 5 is 5 thirds. Next thing I want to talk about is something called piecewise functions. So a function defined by two or more equations over a specified domain is called a piecewise defined function. Okay, here's an example of a piecewise defined function. h of x is defined by x squared plus 3. I use that piece of the function, x squared plus 3, when x's are less than 0. And I use the piece y minus 5 when x's are greater than or, or equal to 0. And then it's asked me to do, sort of like we did in the last problem, what is h of negative 2? All right, so... I need to figure out h of negative 2. So first thing you ask yourself, okay, negative 2 is less than um, 0. So that means I will be using this top equation. And then I would do what I've learned in the last problem. In that top equation, everywhere I see an x, I will plug in negative 2. Negative 2 squared is 4. 4 plus 3 gives us 7. So h of negative 2 is 7. 
Now here we're asked to find h of zero. Well, when x is greater than or equal to zero, so when x is zero, we're gonna use this bottom equation. That's what that piecewise defined function tells us. So in this time, to figure out h of zero, I'm gonna look at the bottom equation, and everywhere I see an x, I'm gonna plug in zero. So zero minus five is just negative five. Okay, now I'm gonna add, now I'm asked to find h of three. Three is greater than or equal to zero, so it's greater than zero, so I'm gonna go back to the bottom equation. So h of three, we'll use the bottom equation, and everywhere I see an x, I will plug in three. Three minus five is negative two, so h of three is negative two. That's how you work with piecewise defined functions. In this class, we're gonna use something called interval notation to describe our domain and our intervals in which we're looking at. And we'll use that throughout this course and you'll use it in future courses as well. So I need to introduce what interval notation is. Interval notation are sets built with parentheses and brackets, each having distinct meanings. Interval notation is always written from smallest number to the largest number. Here are the rules for using parentheses. So you will use a parentheses represent solutions greater than or solutions less than a number. So if you have something like x is greater than three or x is less than four, not including the endpoint that's when you'll use parentheses in this notation we're talking about in a moment. Brackets, on the other hand, represent solutions that are greater than or equal to, or less than or equal to. So this is where you have greater than or equal to three, less than or equal to four. So this, the brackets, you include the endpoint is what you're looking at. So use parentheses to represent inf inf infinity or negative infinity, since infinity is not a number in which you can actually reach in the sense, so you can never be equal to that value. So for our example up here, when I did x is greater than three, the interval notation for this x is greater than three would be three is our smallest value. So and then we go up forever. So not including the three, up forever to infinity. So this expression represented in interval notation would be parentheses three comma infinity. X is greater than four. Again, four, um, X is less than four, so four is our largest number. So our smallest number is gonna be negative infinity, not including yet all the way up to the four, but not including the four. I can get infinitely close to four, but I can't actually reach four. That's how that one would be translated. Now here we're asked to use brackets. X is greater than or equal to three. So three is our smallest number, but we include the three. So we write brackets. Make sure you very distinctly square brackets so I can tell the difference in your writing. And then it goes forever in the positive direction, we never actually reach that. So that's how, that would be our interval notation for x is greater than or equal to three. So for x is greater, um, less than or equal to four, four would be our largest number because we're doing everything smaller than four. So we got negative infinity, parentheses there, up to four, bracket. And those are kind of looking at interval notation. So let's try a few here. Convert each of these into interval notation. I want x is greater than or equal to negative five. So greater than negative five means negative five is my smallest value, and I'm including it, so I put a bracket, all the way up to infinity, parentheses. Parentheses always with infinity. X is less than 12, so 12 is my largest number, so negative infinity is my smallest value, all the way up to 12, not including the 12, so I put a parentheses. Okay, negative three is less than x, which is less than or equal to nine. So our smallest value is negative three. I don't actually reach it, so our parentheses. Largest value is nine, but I include it. So I put a bracket. All real numbers, all numbers, that's all the way from negative infinity to positive infinity. So that's how we distinct all real numbers. Okay, sometimes you have more than one piece. So here, 
we have our first piece, which is this arrow drawn here. And so that's telling us we're going, our um, largest value on that piece is negative two, and it's a filled in circle, so I'm including the negative two. But our smallest value is, that arrow keeps going forever, so it's negative infinity, not including it. And then tell the reader that you're going to another um, part of another piece here, you do union symbol. And then our second piece is this one here. And so our smallest value is negative one, which is included. And then we go all the way up to three, which is our largest value, but we do not include the three because there's an open circle. So this would be our answer to this graph as an um, interval notation. So likewise, our first piece is this. Our smallest value is, is one, which is included all the way up to three, which is included, union. Our second piece is this graph here. Okay, and our smallest value is five, but we do not include that, so parentheses, all the way up forever, so that goes to infinity, and you never include infinity. So that would be our interval notation here. Okay, next topic, let's talk about finding the domain of a function. So the domain of a function set of all real numbers for which the expression is defined. So all x values that work in the equation. So the easiest way to find the domain is find when the, do when the x value is not defined. So what is not in the domain. So if you can figure out when it doesn't what, find all, all x values that do not work and then say everything but that. And we'll always write our domain in interval notation. So when does when can you not have an x value? Well, a lot of these you already know. For one example, recall that you cannot divide by zero. So anytime you have a rational function, which is just a fraction with variables, if you have a rational function, the bottom can never equal zero. So you can never divide by zero. Another thing that you might recall that you cannot do is you cannot take an even root of negative numbers. So you can't have a negative value inside an even root, a square root, a fourth root, a sixth root. And the last one you cannot do that you probably are not familiar with, you cannot have zero or negative numbers. inside a logarithm function, a log function. What we'll do a unit, unit three is over logarithms and exponential functions, so you'll learn a little bit more. I just kind of want to basically uh, introduce this concept, and then we'll do a little bit more detail as we get into um, unit three on this last topic, but just make sure you know that's part of your domain. So. Here, we're going to ask to find the domain of each of these functions. And so you got to find out where it does not work and then exclude that value. So for a, g of x is defined as x minus 3 over x plus 4. This is a rational function because I have a variable in the denominator of the fraction. So I know I cannot divide by 0. So I need to figure out when is the bottom equal to 0. Because that's that gives us our problem child. So I'm going to solve, I'm going to set the equation equal to 0, the bottom of the equation equal to 0, and I'm going to solve that by subtracting 4 from each side. So x equals negative 4. So that tells me what does not work. x cannot be negative 4. So to write my domain, it's going to be everything but negative 4. So using interval notation, my smallest value is going to be negative infinity, all the way up to negative 4, not including the negative 4. And then I'm going to jump over the negative 4, so my smallest value for this interval is going to be negative 4 all the way up to infinity. So my domain is negative infinity to negative 4, union negative 4 to infinity, all parentheses. All right, for g of x here, where we have the square root of 4x minus 3. So this is an even radical. So we're looking at the second exception here. You cannot take an e I cannot have a negative number and even root. So I know 
that 4x minus 3 needs to be greater than or equal to 0. Okay, what's inside the square root has to be positive or 0, cannot be negative. And so I'm going to solve this by adding the 3 to each side and then dividing each side by 4. And I got that x must be greater than or equal to 3 fourths. So my domain is greater than or equal to 3 fourths. So smallest value is 3 fourths. And I'm going to include that. So let me write that as including. So greatest value is 3 fourths, which I'm including that 3 fourths all the way up to infinity, not including it. So that would be my domain of B. Okay, D says, okay, H of X is defined by the rational function 15 divided by X squared minus 2X. So I have variable in the denominator, so I take that denominator, set that equal to zero, and I'm going to factor out my GCF of X and then set each factor equal to zero. And I get x equals zero, and I'm gonna add two to each side, x equals two. So x cannot be zero, x cannot be two. So there's two um, domain, two values that we cannot be, cannot be in our domain. So it's everything but zero and two. So to write that with interval notation, I'd say, okay, from negative infinity to zero, not including the zero, union, then from 0 up to 2, not including the 0, not including the 2. Union, 2 up to infinity, not including the 2. So that would be the domain of this function. Okay, um, in E here we have log base 2 of 4x plus 3. So this is a logarithm equation. So that is looking at the third exception. It cannot have 0 or a negative number inside the logarithm. And so I take what's inside the parentheses, inside the logarithm equation, and that must be greater than zero. So I set up equation 4x plus 3 is greater than zero. Solve for x by subtracting the 3 and dividing by the 4. So I get that x has to be greater than negative 3 fourths. So our domain would be negative 3 fourths to infinity, all parentheses. Okay, now let's talk about finding zeros of a function. So if a graph of a function of x has an x-intercept at the point a comma zero, then a is considered a zero of the function. So the zero of a function of a function f of x are the x values for which the function equals zero. All right, so how to, do, how to find the zeros of the function? So we're given f of x is equal to 4x squared plus 19x minus 5. So I this is, notice it here, f of x equals 0. So I'm going to take this function and replace this f of x with what is equal to 0. So set the function equal to 0 is basically what you're doing. All right, so we need to factor this. Um, factors of 20 that subtract equal 19. Okay, so that would be 4x squared plus 20x minus x minus 5 equals 0. Um, first two terms, GCF is 4x. That leaves us with x plus 5. Second two terms, last two terms, negative 1 is our GCF. That leaves us x plus 5. Now in these two terms, x plus 5 is our GCF. So 4x minus 1. Now, you could have factored that anyway. I did factoring by grouping. But our first term is x plus 5. Our second one is this, 4x minus 1. So to figure out where it equals 0, set each factor equal to 0. And solve. We get negative 5 and 1 fourth. Okay. So... The zeros of this function is negative 5, x equals negative 5, and x equals 1 fourth. All right, now if I have a rational function, I know the denominator cannot equal 0 because it's, it's where it's defined. The function is a function, so it's already been defined, not including that in this domain. So only time a fraction will ever equal 0 is if the top equals 0. So all you have to do for rational functions here is set the the top of the function equal to 0, and then solve for x. I add it 4, and I'm going to divide by 2. 
And so my zero, this function is two. All right, now we're gonna talk about two special types of functions called even functions and odd functions. Okay, a function is said to be even where its graph is symmetric with respect to the y-axis. That is, on the graph for every f of negative x, f of x is equal to. So f of negative x equals f of x. An odd function of the graph is symmetric with respect to the origin, and that is f of negative x equals negative f of x. All right, let me show you graphically what I mean here. So let's look at an even function graph, and let's look at an odd function graph. Okay. So an even function graph looks something like this. Okay. See, it's symmetric with respect to the y-axis. That means if I fold the graph here across the y-axis, one side would land on top of itself. Okay. That's an even function. And so if you think about some points on this graph, so this point here is 1, 1, and then uh, it's kind of high up there, but here we have 2, 4, okay? And then likewise over here, you have the point negative 1, still the same height of 1. And over here, you have negative 2 with the same height of 4. And so f of negative x, so if x was 1, negative x is negative 1. It gives me the same y value as the original function, 1 and 1. That's what that means. Now, an odd function looks like something like this. This would be an odd function. Okay? It's symmetric with respect to the origin. And then say we have the point here, 1, 1. And corresponding to that, we have the point negative 1, negative 1. So if I plug in the opposite of the x value, so if x was 1, opposite of that would be negative 1. And then when x was 1, I got 1 as my answer, the op and I get the opposite answer, which is negative 1. Same thing here. Say this is the point 2, 8. Then down here is the point negative 2, negative 8. So that's how, kind of how that works out. All right. So how do we do this algebraically to determine if we have an even odd function? Well, to figure out if you have an even or odd function, we have our function f of x is defined by 4x squared minus 3x squared plus 1. All you do is replace every x with negative x. So everywhere I see an x, I'm going to plug in negative x and simplify down and see what you get. Okay, negative x squared is x squared. Negative 3 times negative x is positive 3x plus 1. So I look at this, look at this answer here, and I compare it to this answer. Now, is it exactly the same? If it's exactly the same, equals the original, we have a function, okay? And we have an even function. So it's not exactly the same. So that tells us it's not an even function. And then, next thing you try to do is factor out a negative. So if I take out a negative, I get negative 4x squared minus a 3x minus 1. And then, if what's inside here, when I, if negative f of x is what's inside here was the original function, then it would be an odd function. But it's not. So this one is neither even nor odd. So this is neither an even function nor an odd function. Okay. Let's try g of x. So again, I'm going to figure out g of negative x. So everywhere I see an x, I'm going to plug in a negative x. All right, negative x cubed is negative x cubed and minus x. So I look at that and I compare it to my original. So we're taking this, comparing it to the original. It is not the exact same thing as the original, so that tells us it is not an even function. So then I factor out, then I factor out the negative. Oh, I forgot my negative sign here. That should be a plus. Okay. Yeah, I for, for some reason I didn't write the negative when I substituted the x for a second time. And then factor out a negative gives me this. And then again, 
I can pair this right here, what's you know, inside the negative to, to my original function. If they are the same, which case they are the same here, I know that this is an odd function because it's the opposite of f of x. All right, so again, replace every x with negative x. Simplify down, negative x to the fourth becomes x to the fourth. Negative x squared is x squared times a negative one gives us negative x squared minus one. Okay, compare this answer with our original. If they are exactly the same, which they are in this case, we have an even function. And that's how you determine if you have an even function or an odd function.